Welcome to the Healing Grove Podcast. I'm Dr. Kristen Ryman, an integrative holistic family physician, author of Life After Lyme, and host in this virtual space of learning, healing, and growing. I believe humans are like trees, and our physical limb is only one of many. Health on all limbs of the tree, emotional, conceptual, social, spiritual, is absolutely required for the whole tree that is you to be vibrantly well. I created the Healing Growth Podcast as a place to showcase some of the world's best integrative and holistic medicine, to expose you to transformative tools and mindset shifts for all limbs of your tree. I hope you enjoy our conversation in the Healing Grove today as much as I enjoyed having it. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this conversation on this beautiful November evening. I'm really excited to be here with you, and I'm excited to share with you my new friend and longtime Lyme hero, Dr. Bill Rawls. Um, Bill Rawls wrote a beautiful book called Unlocking Lyme that was one of the first things I encountered when I was seeking my way back to wellness out of the hole that was Lyme disease for me back in 2011, 2012. And I'm ever grateful to that book and also just super grateful that you agreed to be here tonight and share some of your wisdom with us. Thank you so much, Dr. Rawls, for being here. Oh, my pleasure. Absolutely. So I'd love to start by just letting you tell your story. Um, and then you, you have, I know you have a presentation for us and I know you also have so graciously offered to host a Q and A at the end. So with that in mind, let's sort of set, settle back and listen to your, your journey a little bit. Oh, sure. Yeah. It's, um, you know, no, no, nobody would pick the pathway that I went down or you went down, you know, it, it, it kind of chooses you. And, um, but I, in a way I'm grateful because I've learned things that few physicians have had an opportunity to do. And just the way that life has folded, you know, it's kind of like, well, maybe I was supposed to be on that journey. So I've been a physician for over 30 years um, I'm conventionally trained. I went into obstetrics and gynecology. That was my specialty because I really didn't like dealing with chronic illnesses because patients never got well. You know, most of the patients I was dealing with were healthy and the procedures and, and, and treatments were straightforward. Patients got well um, and just delivering a baby was just really cool. The downside was in a small town, it came with rigorous night call. Um, every second to third night, I was up a good portion of the night. And this went on for 20 years. And late 40s, uh, my health finally collapsed. Um, and at first identified with fibromyalgia, like so many people finally found that I was carrying some of the, the Lyme disease microbes and was like, yes, finally an answer, took antibiotics that made me sicker instead of better, more frustrations. And you know, when you look at that symptom spread of fibromyalgia or chronic Lyme disease, both of which pretty, pretty much the same, um, I had virtually all the symptoms. My body was falling apart all of my body. And I was afraid. I did not know what to do. I was pretty desperate because I was in a small town where I was still having to practice medicine. I gave up a B call, but I still had to make a living. And I really didn't have the luxury of flying around the world and seeking out help. Um, that ended up being a blessing because by default, I chose herbal therapy because there really wasn't anything else and, but really embraced it. Um, you know, handfuls of capsules two or three times a day. And over years, not months, I got my health back. Um, I saw benefit within months of taking the herbs. So I knew they were doing something but it just kept getting better. And over a five-year period, I had really severe involvement in my heart, my joints, neurological symptoms, everything. All of those symptoms faded away. But what's more, I got back things that I wasn't expecting to. So now at age 65, I've been robustly healthy for a decade. 
but you know, my heart conditions, my, all the heart irregularities went away. Um, my joints that I thought were going to be shot by the time I was 55 are in really good shape. My cartilage is in great shape. My cholesterol went down. My blood sugar went down. My blood pressure went down. Everything got better. So this thing we call chronic Lyme disease put me on a journey that helped me understand our relationship with microbes in a different way. And it helped me understand chronic illness in a totally different way. So what I have to share with you is that 10 year journey of really exploring this topic and trying to figure the, this thing out. And it's carried me to a different place than most people who understand chronic illness. Um, but I think it's really important for us to listen to. So this content that I'm going to present tonight, some of it is very basic and elementary, but it's looking at things that seem very basic in a little bit different way. But I'm going to take you to some different conclusions. And those conclusions, we're still early in the game. There's still a lot of emerging science. And there's a lot for us to learn. But if what I am looking at is real, which I feel very strongly that it is with all the, the, the evidence that's accumulating in the scientific journals, it's going to rewrite our understanding of chronic illness in total. And it's also going to rewrite the solutions that we should be looking at. And one of them is herbal therapy. So that's what I've got to present tonight. Um, the presentation probably will take about 45, 50 minutes. Um, I hope that you find it to be very interesting. Beautiful. And I think um, one thing I'll also add is when we were concocting our plan for tonight, a couple months back, we talked about how cool it would be to get a bunch of providers in the room and, you know, talk to doctors, because this is stuff that you and I and they, we didn't get in medical school or residency. Yeah. Um, it's just so crucial for providers to know this. Um, that being said, as I typically do, I tend to then open up the boundaries and bring everyone in together because that's the way I roll. So if you're not understanding some of the tech, the terminology, or if it's too technical or jargony, just throw it in the chat. I'll define it for you as we go along and we'll get to it at the end. I don't, I want to make sure people are following, even if we get uh, too doctorly at times. Okay. Absolutely. And you know, I, I did the presentation such that it should appeal and be understandable to most anybody. So you should, most people, yeah, you should be okay. Awesome. The time bomb within, that's the title, because that's kind of what it is. And what we're going to talk about is the dormant microbiome. I think everybody hears about microbiome. And when they hear that word, they're thinking about gut or skin. This is different. This is in our tissues, and this is pretty new stuff. So we're going to start by talking about what a microbe is. So we all hear that word, microorganisms. So very specifically, it's microscopic single-celled living organisms referring to bacteria, which are typically anywhere from 100 to 1,000 times smaller than one of our cells, to protozoa, which are a little bit bigger and more sophisticated as far as their cells are more complex like ours, and then fungi. All of these things are microbes. And then there are viruses that really aren't cells, but they act the same. And as I've been going through my journey, when I see how these things function, viruses and bacteria they're very closely related and they act like each other in, in certain ways that make it very interesting. So microbiome, it's the sum of all the microbes that inhabit the body. And of course we have different types of microbiome. So technically it's what a microbiome is, is an ecosystem that microbes survive in. So in terms of our microbiome, it's our body. And we can divide that up to gut microbiome, skin microbiome. Um, you can even have a microbiome of your armpits. And actually, they found that the microbes in our left and right armpits are different. 
Um, right now, they've cataloged somewhere between 20 and 40,000 different bacterial species, but they're just trying to figure out all the viruses that are in there too. Every person's microbiome is different. You know, we have identical twins that have the same genes. Those two people have a different microbiome. So it looks like our microbiome is one of the most unique things about us. So microbe characteristics. This is important. What's the purpose of the microbe? The a microbe's only mission is making more microbes. And to make more microbes, they need food. So they need organic matter. So anything organic, something that is or was once living, is food for other living organisms. So you have to, so, so they have to survive on some kind of organic matter that comes from animals or, or plants or other bacteria. So the microbes that we encounter are host dependent. They must get their food, their nutrients and resources from us to survive. So that's only a very, very small percentage of the microbes out there. So there are a lot of microbes that live in the environment at broad, you know, trillions of different species that really don't interact with us because they're not set up genetically to interact with a living organism. So they survive off of like organic matter in the soil and various places in nature, but they don't really do anything to us. So wherever you are right now, um, the surfaces of whatever uh, uh, tables or chairs or whatever around you are covered in viruses. But those viruses, if they can't connect with your cells, they can't do anything to you. So one thing that's really interesting is bacteria and other microbes follow an unrestricted pattern of growth, all right? So what that means is, as long as they have the right conditions and the right nutrients, they keep growing and expanding at the expense of everything around them. So if you take bacteria and put them on in a dish of food, they will keep growing until all the food is gone. Now, our cells have restricted growth, all right? Our cells, it's like our heart or our liver. You can only fit so many cells in that organ. And if those cells take on unrestricted growth, that's what cancer is. And that's really interesting looking at the unrestricted growth of bacteria and cancer having unrestricted growth. So I'm not gonna get into it too deeply in this lecture, but the connections between bacteria and cancer are very, very strong. So the highest concentration of bacteria in the body is in a large intestine. And they're there, there's a lot of them because there's a lot of food. There's nutrients from all the partially digested food. So there's lots of food for microbes to grow. We have bacteria on our skin. They survive off the oils we secrete, but there the concentration on the bacteria on the skin is much lower than in the gut because there's not as much food. So the food, the amount of food restricts their growth. The problem is that the oils on our skin and the food in our gut isn't the only food source in our body. Any organic matter could potentially serve as a food source for bacteria and other microbes. So the carbohydrates, fats, proteins, organic molecules that make up our tissues, specifically make up our cells, are potential food for microbes. In other words, we're the food. If that doesn't sound like a conflict of interest, wow. So a pathogen, you hear about microbes being pathogens. So what is a pathogen? We hear about that a pathogen is a microbe that causes disease. Well, how do they cause disease? Very specifically, a pathogen is an invasive microbe that does harm by consuming cells and connective tissue in our body. And of course, there are different degrees of pathogens. We have pathogens that live in our gut and on our skin, but 
we have to protect our tissues. So we want to keep those things in the gut and on the skin and away from our cells and our tissues because they can potentially be a real problem. So we have layers of defense. Now you hear about the immune system, but we actually have four primary layers of defense. Normal flora, that's a big one. So when you look at the bacteria in the gut and on the skin, there are a lot of potential pathogens there. And we depend on our normal flora because our immune system really doesn't reach inside the gut contents or out on the skin. So normal flora bacteria that secrete substances that suppress the potential pathogens. And it's because we've had this long-term relationship, millions of years old with these particular microbes, that they don't really try to invade our tissues. They're happy with the food that we give them, but they do secrete substances that affect pathog potential pathogens microbes that are kind of on the borderline that are more of a threat to us. So keeping our normal flora healthy is really important. We also have physical barriers. Barriers are really, really important. So all those bacteria inside the gut need to be kept inside the gut by the intestinal lining. And skin microbes are kept on the outer surface of the skin by that dense waxy coat on the outside. You know, if you had an accident or something and you ruptured your gut, that can be really bad because it frees up all those microbes and they can start eating your tissues. Same thing with your skin. If you have a laceration, your skin bacteria, the skin that live on, the bacteria that live on your skin can get in your deeper tissues. So we also have barriers and other body openings, our sinuses, mouth, bronchial pathways, bladder, vagina, et cetera. But those barriers aren't quite as secure as you might hope. Bacteria, this is, this is pretty new science. Uh, it's a study in 2015 cataloged this data that bacteria are constantly trickling across from the intestines, from our skin, from our sinuses. All of these barriers, microbes trickle across. And when they do, they can invade red blood cells or white blood cells and be carried throughout the body, which is really fascinating. And so there are studies now that are starting to find these microbes, microbes from the gut and sinuses and skin and brain and all kinds of places inside the body that they just sneak across and get there. So we need that immune system as a backup plan. So it helps reduce that threat, reduce that flow, because pathogens from the gut, pathogens from the skin are trying to constantly get across those barriers, any little break, any little crevice that they can sneak through. So we depend on our immune system. So our immune system, as you know, 70% of our immune system is in the gut. And it's because we place uh, immune cells all along those borders between the gut lining and the bloodstream to help pick up those microbes when they cross. But also we have you know, white blood cells circulating in our bloodstream and throughout our system. So our immune system is really important. But it's not just the microbes inside the body that you have to worry about, of course. Foreign microbes are constantly searching, searching for opportunities to get inside. So when you look at that word infection, you know, we all know what an infection feels like, but what an infection is, is a foreign microbe or more commonly microbes trying to break through barriers and the immune system defenses to get at your cells, to get at your tissues. That's what they want. We typically define an infection by the way the microbe enters the body. So we have respiratory infections, sinus infections, intestinal infections, skin infections, and of course, tick bites, mosquito bites, genital infections. So the top, where that microbe, so different microbes specialize in different pathways. You know, some microbes specialize in the respiratory tract because it's a pretty thin barrier and they can get across. Some of them sneak through as sexually transmitted diseases. Tick bites, 
That is nature's perfect vehicle for transmitting microbes. And a lot of different microbes use that pathway. So we tend to identify the infection by the barrier that is crossed. The symptoms of that acute infection are due to local damage in the tissues, either to the skin or to the respiratory system, but also that confrontation with the immune system that occurs at the local site at the border, at the battlefield, but also throughout the body as microbes make their way in. So factors that define whether a microbe or whether an infection will be symptomatic. Low to microbes. It's really interesting. You know, I've, I've seen, have seen an awful lot of people with Lyme disease over the years. And typically about 95% of people who identify with chronic Lyme disease don't remember a tick bite or an acute infection. I'm beginning to think that acute Lyme disease really isn't all that common. And we'll talk about that a little more in a second. But if you get a big load, so the people that are most apt to be symptomatic at the time of a tick bite are the people that got a tick that stayed on for a long time or more commonly got multiple tick bites. The person who was came out of the bushes and the next day picked off a hundred ticks off of their skin. So it's load of microbes, whether that's respiratory or whatever. The state of cellular and immune health, if you're not healthy, the microbes can have more of a heyday and infection with multiple microbes. Now, if, for those of you who identify with chronic Lyme disease, um, you know, we have all these co-infections. So ticks, carry hundreds of different microbes, but it's not just tick bites where you can get multiple microbes. There, I found studies that during the COVID epidemic that they were finding co-infections with COVID, influenza, adenoviruses, other kinds of viruses, and bacteria were coming in at the same time, and that influenced how bad someone became sick. Virulence of the microbe. This is a big one. How So virulence is the potential for the microbe to cause disease or cause symptomatic illness. So virulence is a factor more of the immune system than it is the actual, immune, actual microbe. So the human immune system evolved over millions of years of a repetitive exposure of so many different microbes. And all of that is built into our immune system. It's hardwired. So most of the things that our ancestors have been exposed to, we have built in immunity to it. So that if you have built in immunity, that's going to lessen the chance that you're going to have some symptomatic illness. Something like Ebola virus is really bad because humans have rarely been exposed to it. We have no built-in immunity for it. So most of the things, most of the things, coronaviruses, adenoviruses, and most of the tick-borne microbes, man, ticks have been biting humans since the beginning of time. So we actually do have built-in immunity. And I think that's something that's interesting about Borrelia burgdorferi, the microbe that causes Lyme disease. When you look at Lyme disease, it's very, very rare for somebody to die of an acute infection. In fact, I've never heard of it. They die of long-term complications of chronic illness later, but they don't die at that acute infection. And most people that I talk to that identify with chronic Lyme disease, again, do not remember acute illness. Mm -hmm. So these microbes that we're exposed to, like Borrelia um, and other tick-borne microbes in our respiratory infections are not highly virulent compared to something like Ebola. And some of the things that we've done a good job of eliminating with vaccines like smallpox and other kinds of things like that. So... When you get that initial infection, and here I'm using a tick just because I already had this set up, but this really applies to any kind of infection, whether it's a sexually transmitted infection or respiratory infection, it doesn't matter. So when that microbe enters the bloodstream, what happens depends on whether that built-in immunity is present. So with Borrelia, with 
everyday coronaviruses that we're all exposed to with influenza, there's some built-in immunity. And so the immune system is immediately recognizing those foreign microbes and is making immunity to them. It has built-in mechanisms of dealing with them. So it's immediately uh, uh, engulfing the bacteria and getting rid of them as quickly as possible. So it's a race. The microbes mission is to get to your tissues. The immune system's job is to keep them from getting there. So if you had an infection with something like Ebola virus, no built-in immunity, there's nothing to stop it. It immediately travels throughout the entire system of the body and travels to all organ systems and immediately begins ravaging cells throughout every system in the body. Borrelia, not so much. In fact, very few of the microbes actually make it to the tissues. Most of the time with a Borrelia infection or most of the things that we're exposed to, that symptomatic phase is when the immune, when the microbe is traveling through the bloodstream and there's a, there's a conflict between the microbe and the, the bacteria and, and, and the immune system. So the immune system is doing a pretty good job of eliminating it. So most of the time, the infection does mop them up. And even though that happens, some microbes do get through. Some microbes do get through. So it's, so when they do, if they can make it far enough, they immediately invade cells in the body. And this is happening throughout our lifetimes. From the time we start putting things in our mouths when we're children, we have interactions with microbes that make it to the cells of our body. All right, so let's see here. So many of these microbes have the ability to infect and live inside cells. So this is true of, of Borrelia. Borrelia, the microbe associated with Lyme disease, is a, a uh, facultative uh, intracellular microbe. So it can live outside cells, but when it goes inside cells, it loses that little corkscrew shield and it and it becomes just this free-floating entity called an L form. It's actually kind of like a virus and it acts like a virus. It takes over the cell, the machinery of the cell. And so the cells offer nutrients, refuge, protection from the immune system. So if these microbes can get the cells, they're in great shape. So even if a few make it, yeah, that's what that's 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 all they need to do. So it's very interesting that all of the microbes that we're dealing with inside the body have the capacity to be intracellular. So that's true of all of the tick-borne microbes. That's true of a lot of other kinds of microbes that I'm going to mention. That's true of all of the viruses. That's true of protozoa. Uh, like uh, toxoplasma, which is really, really common. So all of these things have that capacity. Fortunately, our cells are not defenseless. And this is the fourth part of the immune system that I hear, our defense system that often gets overlooked. So when a microbe invades a cell, whether that's a virus, protozoa, bacteria, yeast, doesn't matter. If the cells are healthy, they can take care of themselves. So there's a process called autophagy that cells use to basically refresh themselves, to purge uh, worn out proteins and recycle contents and, and re remake themselves. It's part of the healing process. But they use those same mechanisms to expel or destroy invasive microbes. So a healthy cell can take care of itself. If your cells are weak or damaged though, microbes can take over the cells and use it and basically create an environment inside the cell that favors the microbe growth. But here's the deal, and this is something that I've only learned about within the past five years. Sometimes 
healthy microbes or if microbes invade healthy cells and as part of a survival mechanism, the microbes go dormant. Not alive, but they're not dead either. They are capable of being reactivated. And we're finding this emerging science is suggesting this probably happens a lot. And you hear about this. You know, we all hear about reactivation of Epstein-Barr and, and zoster virus and her different, various herpes viruses and different kinds of, of, of uh, uh, bacteria. So when I'm looking at the case studies showing cases of reactivation, it's really pretty remarkable. Um, there, there are just so many different bacteria, viruses, protozoa that have this capability of being dormant. So if they're dormant, then they can exist without the cell losing function. So again, a bacteria is 100 to 1,000 times smaller than a cell. And viruses are much smaller than that. So you can have bacteria dormant inside a cell, and the cell keeps right on functioning it doesn't inhibit function. So you can feel healthy, not have any symptoms. So you got that infection, you picked it up, you know, back when you were a kid and stuffed things in your mouth at daycare and you picked up a respiratory virus and you had a cough and fever for a couple of days and all the symptoms cleared, maybe that, that virus didn't. Epstein-Barr, but a long list of others. Maybe it was mycoplasma. Maybe it was chlamydia. And those things can still be dormant inside cells throughout the body. So think of all the times that that's happened during your lifetime. Think of all the insect bites. Think of all the scrapes and, and, and all the opportunities that microbes have had to, to enter your tissues. And some of them are very likely still dormant there. So researchers are beginning to be refer to this as the dormant tissue and blood microbiome. And they, this research, uh, they, this particular paper, they were reviewing all of the evidence behind this and suggesting that every single one of us has a dormant tissue and blood microbiome. And there's evidence that we have hundreds of species of bacteria that live in our brain. We have a brain microbiome. We have a microbiome of the heart and liver and even the placenta. So they're finding these intracellular microbes everywhere. It's harder to find them when they're in a dormant state. And that's why this research has taken so, so long to get here. But this particular paper defined how these dormant microbes could be reactivated by cellular stress and result in illness. So if you're if you're healthy, if your cells are healthy, you may not ever hear from them. But if your cells containing these dormant microbes become weakened by stress, eating a bad diet, sedentary lifestyle, chronic mental stress and not sleeping, the aging process itself, it's a factor. Exposure to all the different toxic substances that we are. It's like a time bomb in your tissues and cellular stress is the trigger that sets it off. Okay, so, Bill, hang on one sec, hang on one sec. Can you go back two slides? Because I know my audience and I know there's some people out there freaking out. And I just <laughs> want to point out that this slide, there's only one thing on this slide of things that can reactivate your dormant microbiome that you cannot control and that's your aging, right? Yeah, that's true. Everything else on this slide is a modifiable risk factor, meaning you have control in theory, or you can learn to have control over these things. So just wanted to point that out, people, before you go freaking out. Well, even aging, even aging, you know, if you look at, if you're familiar with the Blue Zone studies that looked at the people that were living the longest throughout the world, these people had a very, very high level of help all the way until the very end of their life. Um, and when you look at their lifestyle, it was very uh, conducive toward cellular wellness. Their cells were healthy. So whatever microbes they were being exposed to were being kept dormant throughout their entire lifetime. Um, but yeah, in the end, they kind of do get you, but... 
you know, that's 90 to 100 years that these people were living on average. So the, the message is take care of yourselves. And this is really, really important for doing this, that yes, we all do have this. And if you allow that cellular health to deteriorate, you start having this reactivation. And I'm starting to wonder, you know, are just everyday arthritis and the little things that we get through life, is that part of this early stages of this? Um, so it's, um, it, it's there, you know, and, and they can, and it can happen in different ways. You can have reactivation of different microbes, um, you know, and, and we, and I have various cases and stories that I'll share, um, if those things come up in the questions and answers, but something to pay attention to, but because we all pick up different microbes. So, you know, some are worse than others. So some of the microbes that I picked up in my life may be not as bad as some others. Um, and different microbes have preference for different cells in the body. So my opinion is that's why chronic illness can happen in so many, many different ways that we have different spectrum of microbes, different microbes reactivating in different ways in different cells. So we have different illnesses. So reading that paper um, about the chronic, uh, you know, the dormant tissue and blood microbiome was startling. Um, you just, and again, this is emerging research. We're still new on the game because I think what we know about, you know, right now there are only a, about uh, uh, 1,400 pathogens that have been defined out of trillions and trillions of possible microbes. I just think that's scratching the surface, you know. Um, here's my list, you know. Here's here's a very short list of things that I've been able to compile that could that have the potential to be dormant in our tissues. You know, we have mycoplasmas and chlamydia's and the tick-borne microbes and funguses and viruses, and I truly think this is just scratching the surface of the potential. I think there are a lot of things in our on our in our gut and on our skin. I was reading yesterday about new research on one of our gut microbes uh, called Enterococcus uh, faecalis that can regularly does slip across and end up in the bloodstream and has and is starting to be associated with different kinds of illnesses. So there's still a lot of research to be done here, but my opinion is the reason that I'm talking about these things is because I think we're crazy not to be paying attention to them because when it comes to finding solutions, there really are no medical therapies, including antibiotics that can address this problem. Antibiotics kill the normal flora, wipes out one of your main defenses, and they stress cells, and they don't get to these intracellular microbes. You're not going to wipe out all the dormant microbes in your system. But when you look at solutions, one I found, herbal therapy, herbs, really fits the problem well. And I'm not going to go deeply into herbs with this lecture because I want to leave plenty of time for us to discuss this. But herbs are a really nice fit. And when you look at herbs, what you're getting is the plant's mechanisms for defending itself. So all plants contain complex chemical substances called phytochemicals. And these phytochemicals are there to protect the plant from a wide variety of stress factors, free radicals, radiation, toxic substances, but a lot of different pathogenic microbes. One thing that I found to be really interesting about herbs though, is these, this chemical spectrum of sub substances compared to like an antibiotic are selective. And this has actually been documented in a scientific study that taking herbs like in the gut and on the skin suppresses pathogens, but does not affect normal flora. So that makes them really attractive. That's why I got away with taking herbs for years and years and they didn't mess up my gut. In fact, I found that herbs do a better job of balancing the gut microbiome than probiotics do. 
But those phytochemicals also include signaling agents that the plant uses to maintain homeostasis, to, to coordinate all of its cellular functions. So when you put all that together, it, it's designed to optimize the plant's ability to survive. So it creates a complex defense and regulatory systems in the plant. And I, that part is just fascinating. So all plants, are not things that you would want to take. Nobody would make the mistake of taking poison ivy twice. Herbs are plants with biochemistry that meshes particularly well with human biochemistry. And we found that out just for million, you know, hundreds of thousands of years of trial and error of humans knowing which plants are okay for us to eat and which ones aren't. So when we consume that spectrum of phytochemicals from herbs, so herbs aren't nutrient rich. They don't have calories. They don't have, you know, it's not a great source of vitamins and minerals. And, and you know, it's not like a multivitamin. What you're getting is this phytochemical defense and regulatory system. And what that does when we take that, it enhances our protection against microbes but it also helps us protect ourselves against free radicals, radiation, other kinds of toxic threats to the cell, and helps us maintain that internal balance that we call homeostasis. So plants do suppress these intercellular microbes, but they're selected for pathogens. Plants protect cells from stress, which is really important. And that helps clear inflammation, optimizes immune functions, but all of these things work together to balance homeostasis. So what homeostasis is, is when all the cells in the body are working in synchrony. We don't think about hormones and chemical messengers as cell signaling, but basically what all of our signaling agents in our body, our hormones, our nerves, all of those things are our cells communicating with other cells so they can coordinate functions. So the brain is constantly monitoring what's going on in the inside and outside and using nerves and hormones to balance the functions inside to match those, uh, to match those conditions. Herbs have a great safety profile. They've been part of our ancient forage food diet. We've been using herbal medicine for thousands of years. And most herbs, the toxic doses is, are extremely high. Um, adverse reactions are low. Now, not to say, you know, when you look at herbs, there's a pretty broad spectrum of what we define as an herb. But um, we, there are herbs out there that do have more toxicity and more drug-like effects. But most of the herbs that I'm referring to here are herbs that are very safe to take on a daily basis. And it kind of makes it a case that we should. So this is the, I, you know, I, I spent three years putting all of this in a book um, that we're doing a promotion right now. So if you have any interest, it's called The Cellular Wellness Solution. You can find it on Amazon, the regular price, but at our website, vitalplan.com slash book, you can find it um, for this, this uh, better price for right now. So I'm going to uh, uh, go ahead and stop sharing and uh, open it up for discussion. And I hope I've got everybody thinking. Yeah, you've given us a lot to think about. I know um, some minds have been blown and, and some people are still kind of reeling from it. Um, this has been such a fabulous conversation. I'm I'm blown away by just how much you know and how much time you spent researching this and and how much time you've given to us tonight. So thank you again. Oh, it's a pleasure. I, I love doing this. I mean, truly I do. I, I have a good time and I appreciate the opportunity so much. Have a beautiful rest of your evening. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Healing Grove podcast. If you liked it, please be sure to like and subscribe. And if you want to deepen your experience further, consider grabbing a copy of the Healing Grove Playbook. With journal prompts for this podcast and 41 others, it's the perfect place to record your learnings, keep track of the tools you explore, and reflect on your own experience. Finally, it's important to mention that even though I am a doctor, nothing you hear on this podcast, whether from myself or my guests, 
constitutes medical advice. Any intervention you try should always be discussed with and supervised by a trusted member of your own healing team. Thanks for listening and see you next time in the Healing Grove.